Hi friends, it's Deanna Willison from Our Blooming Catholic Life. And as promised today, we're gonna dive into what St. Francis of Assisi thought about penance. The original idea for this show came from Pope Francis's recent letter, um, I'm sorry, addressed to the secular Franciscan order, those who were gathered for the general chapter, um, the international general chapter. And I had some confusion about the letter and the way it addressed penance. And so you can see those videos if you want. The first one, I addressed an article that discussed it and just my reaction to it. And the next one, I looked at it with the catechism. And so this one, I'm looking at the early documents, you know, these guys, which are also available online if you don't want to do weightlifting today. Um, but when you go in to the index, you'll see penance actually starts down here, but then continues for most of this page. We're not gonna be able to do all that in this video. I'm pretty sure of that. So we're gonna do just simple penance. Um, but then there's under for Bernard, brother, brothers and sisters, chastity, conversion, death, fornication, Francis, fruit, impose, John of Laverna, John of Penna, lack, lady, Jacoba, nobleman, Practice, preach, purification, remission, request, wufino, service, sign, sin, Stephen, symbol, way, and work. Whew. And then that's just penance. There's still penitence for which you have example and preach. And then penitent. See also third order in a CC, habit, order. Then there's penitentiary. Wait, that one's probably a jail. Hmm. Hey, are those related? And then we get into Pentecost. Oh my, there are so many in here. So the way I thought I'd organize this is just to start with volume. Oh, that's not volume one. Good thing I checked. Start with volume one. Um, the early documents, the saint, again, these are all available online. I think it's at Franciscan Intellectual Tradition. Tons of notes already in here, but I'm just going for these little blue flags and we'll read the little sections. Ooh, we should pr pray our prayer before the crucifix here. Um, the Oratio Anti-Crucifixum, which I don't have memorized, nor do I have it in here. Do I? Hold on just a second. It's actually right down here. It's probably in English in our little guide. I think though I have it in the photos on my iPad. Do you, any of you have it memorized yet? See, I'm good with it and then I go to do it for you and I, I panic on camera. Does anybody else do that? I totally do. Here, I have it. I, you know, I don't have the memory on my computer like I used to. So there it is for you. I can't read it like that though because it's upside or backwards for me. Um, so let's go ahead and pray. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Oratio ante crucifixum. Sume gloriose Deus. Illumina tenebras cordis mehi et da mihi fidem rectum. Spem certen et caritatem perfectum. Sensum et cognitionum domine. Ut facium tuum sanctum et verax mandatum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So let's jump in. We've asked the Lord to enlighten our faith, right? And, and to just guide us on our way. So let's see what we have here in the life of St. Francis. So we are in, again, volume one, early documents, the saint. And we just have the tab on the page. So let's, I'm guessing it's the very first thing, page 136. This is the writings of Francis of Assisi, the undated writings, and this is numbered 23, Humility. Um, I kind of feel like this is an admonition. It says, Blessed is the servant who has been found as humble among his subjects as he was among his masters. Blessed is the servant who always remains under the rod of correction. Faithful and prudent is the servant who does not delay in punishing himself for all his offenses, inwardly through contrition and outwardly through confession and penance for what he did. And a lot of that, we talked about that with the letter where the Pope said he really wanted us to focus on our inward conversion, but then he talked about all the works of mercy he'd like us to do. Um, 
And this does say inwardly through contrition, outwardly through confession and penance for what he did. So let's see if it expands on it. There's only two pure penitential markings in volume one. So here's the next one. This is in the versified life of St. Francis by Henri de Avranches, the seventh book. This is page 478. That was once, but oft and again in different signs, his presence returned, though not like a poor earthly man, but already as one whose own was the kingdom above. It was God's loving kindness honoring his servant, in whose eyes nothing is fouler than the mundane, and whose special possession means owning nothing at all. Although indulgence in meat was never his wish, once a mighty fever forced him to feed on flesh meat. As soon as he was well, the blood-red feast he regretted ever tasting, and assigned himself a penance to a lay friar. Strict orders he gave to tie a rope round his neck and drag him through the city of Assisi, crying out like a herald, Behold, ye citizens, a parasite glutton, a glum-looking fraud. To you he talks well about fasting, but he hates it. Into his hungry maw, fat chickens he's packed. The friars under orders carried out all he was told. The townsfolks were awestruck and say, For just once eating meat, is that the treatment he gets? What of us then, whose diet is blood all the time, whose craving stops short at this earth? Holy men must be fools, or else we are a race of perdition. Francis again gave orders to one of the brothers, that whenever he was wined and dined by people with high notions, the friar was to heap insults on him and call him a dealer and a mountain man. Hard though it was to exactly fulfill these commands, the brother spared him not a whit as he sat among the distinguished, rewarding him with approval for the bad things he said. With honor for abuse, with praise for the insults, it was usual for Francis to say, Brother, I sanction all that you said. In all honesty, the son of Peter Bernadone ought to put up with that without demur. By these means and others, unabashed and forthright, he puts to flight all that flatters the human mentality. As he waits for the day of the Lord, which reveals the secrets of hearts, he cannot be drawn to perform any good for some day of human approval. Thus disentangled, he completed six years of his soldierly deeds. And of course, it goes on from there, this little poem. And so it's saying, Francis so much wanted to not be a scandal to the people that he once indulged in meat. Um, you know, he was probably feeling sick and needed some fortification afterwards, but he was afraid of scandal. So he, it wasn't necessarily that he was afraid of eating that meat. Um, what I'm getting from this is he was afraid of creating scandal for the people. And so he made a very public penance to let the people know. And how did they react? How the people reacted was they're saying, what of us then whose diet is blood all the time, whose craving stop short at this earth? Holy men must be fools, or else we are a race of perdition. And immediately they saw, ah, okay, either he's a complete not all there, or what have we done? And they saw, okay, we're focusing more on this earth, on our life on this earth, and the things that can reward us here. We've been talking about this in the Woman of Grace book club. Oh, the book is upstairs. The Four Last Things by Father Wade Menezes, who reminds us again and again in that book, be eternity minded. I mean, sure, if you are feeling ill, there's really no shame in eating those, but you want to make sure you're not causing scandal to other people. So like if you had that and it was Friday when we don't normally eat meat, but you've been really sick and your spiritual director, your doctor has encouraged you to eat meat, go ahead and do it, but maybe don't go in public and order a giant steak and sit there and make yummy noises, right? Don't be a scandal. That was a great point. Let's come on to volume two. Um, this is St. Francis of Assisi, the founder. And this book had lots of them. Now, some of the tales, I'll admit, I have skipped because they were duplicated from one book to the next. Um, this is on page 323. It appears to be The Remembrance of the Desire of a Soul by Thomas of Chalano, the second book. And we are in chapter, I think it's 80. <laughs> I 
Again, it's page 323 in the book. And the header is the saint's example against excessive familiar familiarity. <laughs> and this one may shock you as well. Once as St. Francis was going to beg beg Vagna, he was so weak from fasting that he could not reach the village. His companion sent a messenger to a certain spiritual lady to ask humbly for some bread and wine for the saint. When she heard this, she hastened to the saint with her daughter, a virgin dedicated to God, carrying what was needed. When the saint had eaten and regained some strength, he in turn fed the mother and daughter with the word of God. But while he was preaching to them, he looked neither at them in the face. And when they left, his companion said to him, Brother, why didn't you look at the Holy Virgin who came to you with such devotion? And the father answered, Who would not fear to look at the bride of Christ? And if preaching is done with the eyes and the faith, she may look at me, but I do not look at her. Many times when he spoke about this matter, he declared all conversation with women was unnecessary except for confession, or as often happens, offering very brief words of counsel. And he used to say, what business does a lesser brother have with a woman except when she religiously makes a request of holy penance or advice about a better life? And remember, that does sound excessive, except when you read, he does say his, his example against excessive familiarity. And we all know that there have been some horrible scandals in our time um, where spiritual directors or priests have made some abuse of women and St. Francis is saying no. It really shouldn't be like that. They're they're not your best friends, right? He's like, we're here to give them advice and spiritual support. Absolutely. Do we need, do we need to look into their eyes to do that? No. <laughs> He's saying no. It's not. It's not that kind of relationship. And the very next chapter is then the saint's temptations and how he overcame temptation. See, so I think it's very clear there why that passage is there. Let's flip to what I think is the next one. I'm on page 425. This is the treatise on the miracles of St. Francis, again by Thomas of Chilano. This is chapter 8. Oh, and this is um, those Francis brought back to life from the jaws of death. And this was a Roman noble nobleman named Rudolfo. He had a tower. It was very high. And as usual, he had a guard in the tower and the guard fell asleep at the very top of the tower. And a weird circumstance happened um, where he fell asleep. They don't even know exactly what happened when he fell asleep on this big pile. And he literally fell down. Um, and then it, because he had fallen onto the roof of the palace from there to the ground, a loud crash woke the whole family. The king, the king or the nobleman, I guess, thought it was an attack and ran out with his sword. And the wife thought, oh, maybe it's my brother. Don't kill my brother sneaking in late at night. And she stopped him from wounding the man. And then they look at him and he never woke. Not at the double fall, nor at the noise did he wake. It says, finally, he was shaken awake with a gentle hand as if deprived of a pleasant rest. He said to his Lord, why are you disturbing my sleep now? I've never rested so easily. I was sleeping sweetly in the arms of blessed Francis. When he learned from the others about his fall and he saw himself, he was on the ground, not above where he was lying was amazed that he had not felt what had happened. Then he promised publicly to do penance, and his master gave him permission to send out on, send out on a pilgrimage. The lady herself sent a beautiful priestly vestment to the brothers staying in her hometown outside the city, out of reverence and honor for the saint. The scriptures promise a great reward for hospitality, and examples confirm it. For the Lord in question had that night given hospitality to two lesser brothers out of reverence for St. Francis. They had also been among those who ran out when the servant fell. And immediately, in order to give thanks to God, he wanted to do penance and to go on a pilgrimage. How lovely. Do we do that when something wonderful happens in our life? Do we remember to go and do some penance? and possibly set out on some sort of pilgrimage. There's lots of pilgrimage sites I know all over America. Depending on where you live, there's probably one near you. You can go on. Let's jump over to page 428. We're in the same book, same chapter. And now we're on a man named Niccolo from the town of Soprano one day fell into the hands of cruel enemies. With beastly rage, they heaped blow upon blow on him and did not stop their cruelty until they had thought him dead or soon to die. 
They left him half dead and went away spattered with his blood. When the first blows fell on him, Niccolo had started crying out in a loud voice, Help me, St. Francis! Save me, St. Francis! Many heard his voice from far away, but they could not help him. When he had been carried home, drenched with his own blood, he claimed that he was not about to die, and he did not feel any pain because St. Francis had come to his aid and begged the Lord that he be allowed to do penance. So cleansed of blood, and contrary to any human hope, he was rescued. So St. Francis didn't just even save him. He saved him that he might do further penance, whether that was for himself or, or for the rest of us, but so that he was at his hour of death and that Francis came to him and said, no, no, Lord, he has more penance to do. That could be what it was. You know, you don't want to die with some sort of sin or penance on you or, you know, some great, uh, not penance, some great price that you still have to fulfill. So St. Francis was like, no, no, let him live so that he might do penance, which is sounds a lot like the Psalms where the Psalmist cries out, no, Lord, who can, who can show your glory and mercy from the grave? Like no one will hear me there. Save me, Lord, that I may show your glory. And so this man was able to do that. Um, let's see, we are now on the same book, but we're now in chapter 17 in, in this volume. It is page 459, and we're up at the top. A boy had one leg so deformed that his knee was pressed against his chest and his heel against his buttocks. Imagine that. That's not pleasant. He was carried to the tomb of the Blessed Francis while his father was mortifying his own flesh with a hair shirt and his mother was performing severe penance for him. Suddenly, the boy had his health fully restored. So in this case, the young boy was very crippled and his parents in great faith took him on a pilgrimage to the grave of Blessed Francis and both parents were doing penance the whole way and the boy had his health fully restored. What a beautiful story about a parent's love. On page 480, we're now in an Umbrian choir legend, The Miracles of St. Francis, and we're on page 480. In the city of Capua, a woman vowed to visit the tomb of Blessed Francis in person. Because of the press of her household matters, she forgot her vow and suddenly lost the use of her right side. On account of pinched nerves, she was unable to turn her head or her arm in certain directions. So overrun with pain, she, she that she, she wore her neighbors out with her constant wailing. And two brothers happened to pass by her home. And at a priest's request, they stopped by to visit the pitiful woman. She confessed to them her unfulfilled vow. And when she received their blessing, she right away arose healthy. And now that she was wiser for her penance, she fulfilled her vow without delay. And that's remembering, remember we talk about Fiat 90 and one of the dangers to women is multitasking, right? And that's even in the Bible, getting so caught up in hospitality and housework, which is a great thing. But don't forget, praising God is number one. What's the first commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And you do need to take care of your responsibilities, but you should not get so caught up in them that you forget your number one duty. And so this woman did. Her penance was that she fulfilled her vow. That was a very fair penance that she got there. We should all be fulfilling our vows, right? And we're going to flip back to page 524. And this is, it says it's Bonaventure of Bagnoregio. Um, the evening sermon on, on St. Francis from 1255. I'm on page 524. And it says, I, I do love this. Sorry, I, I love this whole whole little section here on this page what's left. But his vices as beggars are accustomed sorry, as beggars are accustomed to show their afflictions in public. As Sirach advises, humble yourself before you are sick, and when you have sinned, make known your regret. We do that by honest and accurate confession of sins. Third, he must train himself to hard work and discipline, for these protect humility. Scripture tells us that Esther humbled her body and that every part she loved to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. That is how one ought to constantly maintain atoning humility in oneself. As the truly penitent psalmist says, I humbled myself with fasting. 
Consequently, anyone who desires to keep humility intact must persevere in chastising his flesh continually by fasts and vigils, prayers and penance. Fourth, he must learn to despise being honored. One achieves this by striving to be considered worthless, which people generally despise. This is what King David did. I will make merry before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. The same is true of St. Francis, who had himself dragged naked like a silly drunkard through the city. Remember, we had talked about that earlier when he had the rope tied around his neck and he was dragged around, but who also took care of lepers. And so because he left us an outstanding example of humility, with every right he says to us, learn from me to be not only meek, but also humble of heart. For I am most meek and humble. Therefore, these words from Sirach apply to him. There's a man who is slow and needs help because of his severe penance, who lacks strength and abounds in poverty because of the extreme poverty and indigence he embraced. But the eyes of the Lord have looked upon him for his good, and by bestowing upon him the gifts of grace and lifted him out of his low estate and raised up his head by delivering him from the miseries of this life and leading him to the heights of glory. May the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the prayers of St. Francis, lead us to those same heights. Amen. And if you've never noticed, friends, when you read this book, I don't know if they have it in the online free version, but the scripture references are all here on the side to go along with it. We have several more just from this volume. I'm glad you've stuck with me this long. These are so valuable, friends. I could spend days going further into these readings, reading the whole selection, not just these, these little bits. I'm on page 546. This is now Bonaventure of Bagnareggio. The Major Legend of St. Francis, Chapter 3. I'm on page 546 at the top. At the same time, another good man entered the religion, bringing the number of the man of God's blessed offspring to seven. Then the pious father called all his sons to himself, and as he told them many things about the kingdom of God, contempt for the world, the denial of their own wills, and the chastising of their bodies, he revealed his proposal to send them out to the four corners of the world. For the poor and sterile simplicity of our Holy Father had already brought seven to birth, and now he wished to bring to birth in Christ the Lord all the faithful of the world called to the cries of penance. Go, the gentle father said to his sons, sons, while you are announcing peace to the people, preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins, be patient in trials, watchful in prayer, strenuous in work, moderate in speech, reserved in manner, and grateful for favors, for because of all these things, an eternal kingdom is being prepared for you. As they humbly prostrated themselves on the ground before God's servant, they accepted the command of obedience with a spirit of joy. And then he spoke to each one individually. Cast your care upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He was accustomed to saying this phrase whenever he sent a brother under obedience. Knowing that he should give himself as an example to others, he too then set out with one companion for one part of the world that he might first practice rather than preach. The remaining six he sent to three other parts of the world, thus forming the pattern of the cross. Penance was through and through St. Francis. Let's see here, where is the next one? This is again the major legend of St. Francis, chapter 5. One night, while he gave himself to prayer in a cell at the hermitage of Sartiento, the ancient enemy called him three times, Francis, Francis, Francis. When he replied to him, he asked what he wanted, and that one continued deceitfully, There is no sinner in the world whom God will not forgive if he is converted. But if anyone kills himself by hard penance, he will find no mercy for all eternity. At once, by a revelation, the man of God recognized the enemy's treachery, how he was trying to call him back to being lukewarm. This was surely shown by what followed. For immediately after this, oh, and talks about St. Francis resisting a great temptation. Remember, at once by revelation, here's, here's the lie that Satan gave him. There is no sinner in the world whom God will not forgive as he is converted. But if anyone kills himself by hard penance, he will find no mercy for all eternity. Whew. That is a lie, friends. And it says right there that Francis, as at once by revelation, the man of God recognized the enemy's treachery and how he was calling him back to being lukewarm. Don't, don't fall for that lie, friends. Do not be lukewarm. Uh, oh, and here, then, this leads into the um, story of the snowman. 
even more inspired by a wonderful fervor of spirit. Once he opened his cell, he went out into the garden and throwing his poor, still naked body into the deep snow, he began to pack it together by the handful into seven mounds. Showing them to himself, he spoke as if to another person. Here, the larger one is your wife. These four over here are your two sons and two daughters, and the other two are a servant and a maid who are needed to serve them. Hurry then and get some clothes because they are freezing to death. But if the complicated care of them is annoying, then take care to serve one master. At that, the tempter went away, conquered, and the holy man returned to his cell in victory, because while he froze outwardly as penance, he so quenched the fire of lust within that he hardly felt anything of that sort from that time on. I do love the image of St. Francis with the snowman, but because he did, he, he had the Friars Minor as well. He had the poor Clares and the secular Franciscans. And we are his children, but it was not his need to, to clothe us. He trusted us to God. And that's the difference of the spirit of lust there. Spirit of lust is not so much trusting in God all the time, is it? So Francis was able to avoid that temptation. Back here in related documents. We have the Dominican Hagiography and Sermons on page 799. And it says, once when Francis was courteously invited to dinner by a knight, he said to him, brother host, take my advice and confess your sins because you will soon be dwelling elsewhere. The soldier quickly followed his advice, put his house in order and accepted a salutary penance. Then as they went into dinner, the host suddenly expired. And that is one of the reasons secular Franciscans are told to get their will in order and to start letting go of material things. Put your soul, put your material and your soul in order. So ask for that penance now. Don't delay. Go to confession and penance. The last two selections are out of number three. St. Francis of Assisi, early documents, the prophet. Again, some of the stories duplicated, so I'm only reading um, a small selection. This is chapter two of what? A book of the praises of St. Francis Bernard, by Bernard of Bessay. This is chapter two, the formation of the first disciples, um, towards the bottom of page 39 in our big volume. When the rich of the world went out of their way to visit them, they received them quickly and kindly and would invite them to call them, them back from evil and prompt them to penance. Wherever they met men on the roads or in the piazzas, the brothers would encourage them to love and to fear their creator. They would more willingly accept hospitality among priests than among other seculars. But when they could not obtain lodging, they would inquire who in that place was God-fearing with whom they could be most suitably lodged. And although they were extremely poor, they were always generous in giving to all who asked of them, sharing the alms given to them. Isn't that just lovely, friends? I just found that to be a lovely passage. And I'm going to end with um, a small selection from the Deeds of Blessed Francis and His Companions. And this is chapter 16. God reveals to St. Clair and Brother Sylvester that St. Francis must preach. And this is addressing the part of the letter that said about how we loved secular Franciscans, their number one play is, you love to be in the world. And yes and no, I said, and I would address it. And it came up in my research on penance. And so I will read to you. It's page 468 and 469. In the beginning of his conversion, at a time when St. Francis had already gathered several followers, he found himself struggling with a great doubt. Should he spend his time in constant prayer? Should he sometimes go out preaching? He very much wanted to know what would best please the Lord Jesus Christ and holy humility would not allow St. Francis to decide this in advance for himself. He turned to the safe haven of others so that by their prayers he might discover God's good pleasure. So he called Brother Maceo and said to him, My dear brother, go to Claire and tell her for me that she, along with one of her spiritual companions, should beg God on bended knee to show me whether I should sometimes preach or should constantly spend time in prayer. Go also to Brother Sylvester, who was staying on Mount Subiaso, and tell him the same thing. This was the same Lord Sylvester who saw the gold cross coming from the mouth of Francis as high as the heavens and as wide as the ends of the earth. He was a man of such great holiness and grace that whatever he asked was immediately granted. The Holy Spirit had made him uniquely worthy of conversation with God, and for this reason St. Francis held him in great devotion and had great faith in him. This saintly brother Sylvester was staying by himself in that place. 
as he has been ordered by St. Francis, Brother Maceo first brought the message to Blessed Claire and then to Brother Sylvester. Brother Sylvester immediately went to pray, and when he prayed, he immediately received an answer from God. He quickly came out to Brother Maceo and said, God says this, You tell Brother Francis, I did not call him only for himself, but so that he might produce a harvest of souls, and that through him many might be won. After this, Brother Maceo went back to St. Clair to find out what she had received from the Lord. She said that both she and her companion got an answer from the Lord similar in every way to Brother Sylvester's answer. So Brother Maceo returned to St. Francis. The saint received him with charity, washing his feet and preparing a meal. When the food had been eaten, he called Brother Maceo into the woods, and bearing his head, crossing his hands and kneeling, he asked, What does our Lord Jesus Christ wish me to do? Brother Maceo answered that the blessed Christ answer to Brother Sylvester and to Sister Claire and her companion was the same. He wants you to go out preaching because God did not call you only for yourself, but also for the salvation of others. Then the hand of the Lord came over St. Francis. In a fervor of spirit, he rose completely on fire with the power of the Most High and said, In the name of the Lord, let's go. He took Brother Maceo and Brother Angelo as his companions, both holy men. He went out like a thunderbolt driven in his spirit, paying no attention to road or path until they came to a town named Canera. There he preached with such fear, fever, <laughs> fervor, and by a miracle, swallows kept silent at his command so that all the people of Canera, men and women, wanted to leave the town and follow him. However, St. Francis said to them, Don't be hasty. I will arrange what you should do for your salvation. And from that time on, he thought about making a third order for the salvation of everyone everywhere. How lovely, friends. Oh, wait, he sent them away then, greatly consoled and ready for penance. <laughs> Wasn't that worth it if you stayed with me to the end? Don't be hasty. I will arrange what you shall do for your salvation. And for that time on, he thought about making a third order for the salvation of everyone everywhere. He sent them away, greatly consoled and ready for penance. Yay, us. <laughs> And thus we are, the brothers and sisters of penance. Let us not forget that most of all. Sure, we, we are required to do great works of mercy. And that is, works of mercy are a form of penance. But let us not forget prayer, fasting, and almsgiving as well. Those are my thoughts so far. I hope you're finding some enrichment. I know some of you have been reaching out to me privately with your thoughts on this, but if you feel comfortable, please put them in the comments below so that we can have a great conversation together. I hope this has helped you grow in your Franciscan charism. If you've just realized that you have a Franciscan charism from watching these videos, then I encourage you friends to go to the Secular Franciscan website. Um, I'll put that in the description. I'll put the whole link and you can just click on it and it will help you find um, a secular Franciscan fraternity near you where you can find out more about the secular Franciscan order. God bless you, friends. Get out there and do some works of penance. <laughs>